Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to another class. Uh, let's just begin uh, this time with the word of prayer. Uh, so can one of us please lead us in prayer? Maybe Subhajit, uh, can you please lead us in prayer? All right, go ahead, Ken. Go ahead. Uh, Heavenly Father, Jehovah, we thank you for this paper that you've given us today to come and learn your word, Father Jehovah. It's my prayer, Jehovah, that we are one that's going to be head knowledge to us, that is going to be productive in our lives, Father Jehovah. We thank you for your servant, Pastor Manuel, who is going to teach us, Father Jehovah. Let his words multiply in our lives, Father Jehovah. I pray, Pastor, and believe in you that whatever man can be is going to be for your honor and glory. I pray the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Kennedy. Okay, uh, so before we go ahead, uh, let's just look at what we did yesterday. So yesterday we established the fact that we as believers are God's fellow workers, right? So if God is doing something, right, we are God's fellow workers. So that fact is established. So God himself wants to pour out his presence upon his people, wants to pour out his glory upon his people. And so we as his fellow workers, uh, you know, have to work along with him in the sense that, uh, you know, we say, God, we know that you want to pour out your presence. You want to, uh, you know, pour out your, uh, let there be an outpouring of your Holy Spirit among us. And as we pray that, remember that we are not praying for something that's abstract, something that God is still planning or something that God is uh, not aware of. No, God knows it. And so we are co-laboring or co-workers with God. And we saw that. Revival is a pure work of God. It's not a formula. It's not something that, you know, uh, we can replicate. Looked at the old, uh, uh, in the uh, early uh, revivals, we saw that, uh, you know, people prayed and uh, spent time in God's presence. Yes, that's the, that's what we also should do. But uh, the work of the revival is not something that can be born out of the flesh, right? The outpouring is through the Holy Spirit. And so we looked at a few variations as well. The time that God chooses, the duration. Sometimes people pray for five years. Sometimes it's one year. Uh, so again, these are things that God alone chooses, uh, whether it's a city or a town or a village or college campuses. The person, right? God can use a qualified, unqualified, uh, famous or just a simple person, uh, a young, old people, God can use anybody. Uh, and then we also looked at the manifestations of these revivals where uh, many signs and wonders happen and uh, uh, sometimes they may look the same, sometimes they may be in different, uh, with different variations. So the important part is to remember that we are co-workers with God. Right. So when we are praying, it's not only that, uh, you know, uh, maybe like we mentioned yesterday, we're praying, we're praying. It's been five years, 10 years. And if we don't see any move happening, uh, you know, around us, we must not lose faith. We must continue. We must continue to stay strong because remember, this is a sovereign work of God. Uh, it's not like God is sitting there and saying, OK, let him pray some more. Let me see. No, like God is a good God. But even as we pray and even as we seek more of his presence, remember that he is changing us from glory to glory. Uh, so it's not like we can say, you know, it's just a waste of time. I've been praying for 10 years of revival and I don't see it happening. No, God is building us precept upon precept, strength by strength, glory to glory. Right. Then we also looked at how a local church community can uh, you know, uh, receive and prepare itself to uh, steward an outpouring. Right? An example we looked at was the Azusa Street Revival where, you know, uh, he had everything going. The revival was, you know, just exploding. Thousands of people. He had good teams, uh, but he could not prepare his people, right? Uh, he could not prepare good teams. And so we looked at how Two aspects. One is 
preparing people and today's class we look at the second point so in preparing people we looked at how we are to train people to take up the responsibility uh Moses did that he raised up leaders and apostle Paul raised up plenty of leaders and we saw that Paul himself said uh in first Thessalonians chapter 2 uh he said that you are my crown in the presence of God so it's not the works we do uh, or uh, or the physical manifestations of the work but the people are, are the crowns and we also uh, focused on uh, you know the focus on pursuing god's presence and not people uh, not sorry not programs and not events and all of it uh, which is which are important programs events all these are important to build each other up but the focus is pursuing people uh a uh, very important thing we also talked about was that especially in APC uh we believe and we impress on each of our uh, church folks in their hearts that every believer is a minister of god uh, uh nobody is can say no i don't have anything to do um in the body of christ no every believer is a minister of god the moment we are praying for somebody praying for their needs encouraging them exhorting them uh building them up in the faith we are ministering to them and so we are a minister of god so uh the first one was how to prepare for a uh it's uh, you know for an outpouring of god first one is prepare people right we looked at it yesterday very 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 important if you are in a leadership team be sure to raise up leaders you know sometimes we come, we may come to a place when we feel that we know we can do all, everything right uh, okay i i can preach i can minister i can start the small groups i can go for outreach and the more we you know maybe we can do all of it but what is going to happen is if we don't have good leaders to take up new roles plenty of problems one we will not have enough you know uh, uh people who are being built up in the faith too we will have a burnout right remember what happened to moses uh, moses's father-in-law comes and says why are you doing all these things uh, raise up people let them handle these things so that was a brilliant uh, you know uh, plan that his father-in-law uh, gave him and he was able to you know uh, do that which helped him also uh, and totally also to continue the ministry in the right way to build and consolidate a ministry right so first one preparing people preparing teams very 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 important uh, a lot of ministries have seen a breakdown uh, because of lack of teams right uh, sometimes maybe it could be a reason could be that you know i've i've noticed this in a couple of places where uh the pastor will raise up a few young leaders and uh you know maybe once they will give them an opportunity to share the word and if they share the word better than the pastor and that's a problem oh what if they like him more than me and so then they will you know just try to snub the person away or they will just not give them any importance uh you know and that would be the wrong thing to do uh that's why we also looked at being kingdom minded it's not about me myself it's about building god's kingdom so the second point in in the whole thing of uh, stewarding a revival in a church community is to pursue in prayer as you prepare people as we build people have a good leadership team have good volunteers uh, have people to you know look to the vision to the, to fo- to lead them towards the vision of the church uh, train them right uh, be available for them lead by example After, as you do that the other side we must also pursue in prayer now there should be this balance we cannot say that hey i have trained 50 people here and 10 people in this team 10 people in that team that's good that is organization but this if we miss out on the spiritual part of it which is prayer and uh, you know uh, worship and reading of the word teaching of the word if we miss out on that then the whole point of having the teams and having this whole you know structure uh, is not going to serve the purpose right 
So we need to pray. We need to have teams and prepare people. And we need to prepare people and pray. So they go hand in hand, right? Uh, it's like this. Your gifts and your callings are always parallel to each other, right? Uh, 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 so it's like a railway track. Your gifts and your calling, the same way. We prepare people and we pray, right? Uh, so they go hand in hand. Even as you choose people in your team, choose leaders, choosing volunteers, we need to do it prayerfully. There will come times, uh, uh, even as we, you know, uh, uh, we are leading, there will, be, there will come times when people, uh, you know, there will be misunderstandings in teams, right? So we as believers and leaders have to be able to, uh, you know, bring the right decisions, confront those problems and, and solve, resolve conflicts within teams. Uh, and so we can learn more about that in church administration, which is there, I think in the final year you'll have that. But remember this, that as you're building teams, building people, pursue in prayer. Uh, yes, so uh, Charles, we're on page 88, the second point, pursue in prayer. Right. So encourage prayer, uh, personal prayer, encourage corporate prayer uh, within the church community. Right? Uh, to encourage people to meet in small groups. Uh, this is a very powerful and very important uh, aspect of church community. Right? When, uh, remember the uh, Korean revival. Right? Uh, David Yonggi Cho also, uh, Pastor David Yonggi Cho, it was the small groups that really affected and birthed the revival uh, in Korea. The small groups. We started plenty of small groups, thousands, hundreds of people started coming, and then the small groups again divided into different groups. Uh, so encourage small groups to meet in prayer, right? And then there's the corporate prayer. Now, it is very important to maintain proper order while pursuing for revival, right? Uh, there should be order. Right. When I say order, it should not, uh, what I mean is, it's not that, okay, if God is working in a, in a different way that we don't go by it, no. Uh, when I say order, it is that, you know, we have certain, uh, a leader who's facilitating uh, the, the prayer times. We have a proper order in the way prayer is happening, right? Uh, now, let me just give you this example. If we've got, uh, it's something to do with even unity in prayer. If we've got about uh, 10 small groups in a church, right? And five small groups are praying for revival, but the other five small groups are praying for healing and all of that, healing, deliverance. It's good. Uh, but when there's order, there's unity, you will see a greater work of the Holy Spirit. Right? So, uh, when pursuing revival, we should not neglect progress, right? Even as we're making progress step by step, uh, trust God, have faith in God, right? Uh, never look and never look at the situation and say, okay, um, no, I think uh, we have to just change our prayer points. No, uh, we pursue in prayer, right? And so, Let's look at his presence and glory in terms of revival. Right? Revival is basically a cry for God's glory to be revealed upon us. Uh, we say, God, reveal your presence, reveal your glory. Uh, let the glory of God uh, be seen upon us. We sing a song. We sing a lot of songs also. Let the, let the glory of the Lord rise upon us. Uh, let your glory fill our hearts. Let the glory fill your temple. Right? So a lot of emphasis on glory, right? God desires for his glory to be revealed on his people. We looked at that because, you know, when we, we looked at how we are God's co-workers, uh, God desires to pour out his glory. So that is established, right? Now let's read the scripture, Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 14. Uh, I'll just read that, Habakkuk 2 and 14. For the earth 
will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters covers the sea. Right? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge and the glory of the Lord as the waters covers the sea. This is God's promise. Right? The earth will be filled with the knowledge and of the glory of God as just how the waters cover the sea. So let's pick up a few points here. First one, God desires his glory and knowledge to, uh, you know, uh, the glory of his knowledge to fill the earth. One of the classic passages is Isaiah chapter 60, 1 to 3. Right? Uh, can one of us please read that? Uh, Isaiah chapter 60, 1 to 3. Yes, can one of us please read that? Uh, Isaiah 60, 1 to 3. Yes, sir. Isaiah chapter 60 and 1 to 3. Right, arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Thank you, Susan. Right, so now let's picture this. Isaiah is writing to the Israelites, to the Jews, and he's saying, Rise, shine, your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Now, this during this time, the Israelites were in Assyrian captivity, right? They were taken captive from Assyria, uh, sorry, from Jerusalem, and they are in Assyria, Babylon, right? Uh, portions, some are there, and and what are they doing there? They are in captivity, right? They are not in their own land. Right, uh, so they are eating the fruit of uh, the labors of, uh, meaning they are in the land there as slaves, working. Right now, during that time, right, it was most probably that uh, the Jews were not given, uh, you know, a lot of freedom to have their rituals and sacrifices and their, uh, you know, all the sacrifices that we see in the Book of Numbers. Uh, it is most probably by that certain few things maybe were allowed. Uh, maybe the Sabbath day was uh, something that they could follow. Uh, but we don't have an account of what are the feasts and all of that that they followed. Maybe they did follow it. But because it was a time of captivity, right? And here Isaiah is writing and saying, okay, look, it looks like you are in captivity. It looks like your, you know, things are fading away. But listen, don't put your head down. Don't fall into the ground. Don't feel that I've left you. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. And it doesn't say the glory of the Lord is going to rise upon you. It says the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Right? And then in verse 3, he says, The Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. So, what does that mean? When God pours out his presence, when God reveals his glory upon us, right? the Gentiles shall come to our light. Now picture this. The Israelites are there in Assyria. They're in captivity. When the glory of the Lord came upon them, the Israelites, sorry, the Gentiles, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, those who are uh, not of uh, the covenant, they will see the, your light, meaning they will see the glory of God upon you and they will come to know you, to know the true God. Right? So God desires to reveal his glory. Now, why are they in captivity? Yes, the Israelites have been you know, so committing sin, committing, if we look through the Old Testament, constantly, 
you know, God is sending prophet after prophet after prophet. He's saying, turn from your ways. Turn from your wicked ways. You're looking at Israel. So you've got your northern kingdom. You've got your southern kingdom, Judah and Israel. And so God is sending prophets to the northern kingdom and then to the southern kingdom. And uh, it's just prophet after prophet, turn from your ways. But it, it is not really happening. You know, few of them are changing. Few of them are turning to God. But still, they were living in some kind of uh, immorality and, and idol worship. Yet, God is saying, arise, for I will reveal my glory upon you. It is so wonderful that even in our sin, here in the Old Testament, God is saying, I will, I will release my glory because I desire to do it. And when I release my glory, Gentiles shall come to your light. Second one, God's glory will be revealed through his people. Isaiah chapter 63, 1 and 2. Sorry, Psalm 63, 1 and 2. Yes, could one of us please read that? Psalm 63, verses 1 and 2. Psalm 63, verse 1 and 2. O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Amen. Thank you, Prabhakar. So we see here that David is praying, and he. this is basically a cry for revival. And what he's saying here is, Lord, I, I early I will seek you. My soul thirsts for you. Right? My flesh longs for you. I desire you so much in a land where there is no water and I want to see your glory and your power, right? David expresses his hunger and thirst for God. Remember a few chapters uh, before we, we looked at how God responds to those who are hungry for him, right? God, it's not that God only responds to those who have are well-educated or who have completed, you know, certain courses, or those who, you know, uh, uh, follow a certain routine. No, God responds to hunger, and so here the psalmist is is expressing his hunger and thirst for God, just like how, when we are tired and weary, we want just a drink of water. Just like how, you know, when we haven't eaten for many days, we just want probably a piece of bread. The, the body longs for that, right? The same way David is saying, I long for your presence. I long for, I desire for your power and your glory to be revealed among us. And here's the thing, uh, uh, you know, I don't know if it's happened to you, uh, but to me, imagine we, you know, we've been working uh, uh, the whole day and we're really tired, right? And we are thirsty, right? Uh, what if somebody gives us, you know, uh, uh, a bottle of, you know, one of these fruit juices or these sodas, like a Pepsi or something? We drink it, but is it going to quench our thirst? At least for me, it doesn't. Right? Maybe it'll keep us for a for an hour or so. But it is water that quenches our thirst. Right, only water quenches our thirst. So, what am I trying to get at? Now, there will be times we may feel all right, but remember that 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 whole thirst inside us should be something that is constantly, uh, you know, uh, driven in our hearts. They so say, God, I know you've you know ministered to me, but I want more of your presence. I want you to reveal your glory more in my life. Speak to me through your word. Speak to me through your Holy Spirit. And so that thirst continues. That hunger for God becomes more and more and more. Right? So what does the manifestation of God's glory look like? We, we read in Isaiah and Psalms that God wants to reveal his glory. So what is the glory? What does the manifestation of his glory look like? 
uh, a very, very important passage. Uh, uh, we'll read this because it, it gives us a whole context, a whole understanding uh, of the glory of God. Now, Exodus chapter 33, let's read 11 to 14, verses 11 to 14. Exodus 33, verses 11 to 14. Yes, one of us, please go ahead. Exodus 33, 11 to 14. Yes. Shall I read, Pastor? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, Exodus chapter 33, verses 11 to 14 says, So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face, as a man speaks to his friend. And he would return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you may you say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Avni. So we just look at a few examples from and few, um, you know, insights from this whole uh, encounter that Moses had uh, with God on the mountain right now. God is talking to Moses and he's reminding Moses, okay, Moses, I am going to send you to Egypt to bring the people out, bring the people out of Egypt. Right now, Moses, he knew it when he was 40 years old. The burning bush was just a reminder. And then Moses is asking this question to God and he's saying, okay, God, you're saying all of this, but how, who, who are you going to send with me? And how are you going to do it? Show me your ways. Who are you going to send with me? And I, I, I can't go alone. I can't go with Aaron. Okay, I'll go with Aaron. But do you think the Pharaoh and all of them are just going to say, okay, take my take your people and go? No. Now how are you going? How are you going to do this? Tell me how. So that's a genuine, genuine prayer, right? Or a genuine question. God is saying. I'm going, I've chosen you to bring the people out of Egypt. Moses is asking, how are you planning to do this, God? Uh, uh, show me your ways. Is there a plan A, plan B, plan C? Um, and God's response in verse 14 said, my presence will go with you. Right? God replied, my presence will go with you. And then he will give us victory, meaning he will give us rest. Now, it doesn't end there. Now, God has said, okay, uh, my presence will go with you. But Moses continues the, con con the whole conversation and he expresses his desire for that to happen. Right? Let's read verses 15 to 17. Same chapter, verses 15 to 17. Avni, you can go ahead. Just continue with the same verses. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, verse 15, then he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Avni. So here, again, Moses, so God has told Moses, my presence shall go with you, right? Now, after that, Moses is saying, okay, but if your presence is not going with us, God, do not bring us up here. Because without your presence or without your you going before us, we will not be able to fulfill this task. It was clear in his mind. Moses is no warrior. He is no great speaker. Uh, he was not eloquent at speech. He was not 
somebody who could you know just make commands and everyone listen to him he was a very humble man right but he says god if you are not going with us don't 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 let's drop the plan but verse 17 the lord said to moses i will do this thing that you have spoken for you have found grace in my sight it goes on moses then makes another request right first moses asks god what is your plan god says my presence will go with you second moses says now if your presence is not going with us let's drop the plan right and then again moses makes another request let's read verse 18 to 23 go ahead avni 18 verse 18 verse yes, 18 to 23 and he said please show me your glory then he said i will make all my goodness pass before you and i will proclaim the name of the lord before you i will be gracious to whom i will be gracious and i will have compassion on whom i will have compassion but he said you cannot see my face for no man shall see me and live and the lord said here is a place by me and you shall stand on the rock so it shall be while my glory passes by that i will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while i pass by then i will take away my hand and you shall see my back but my face shall not be seen amen 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 thank you avni so what a powerful uh, you know encounter this is moses makes his final request he says lord first i asked you i requested you you said my presence will go with thee okay second i said if your presence is not going with us let's you know just not do this let's just uh, you know wait for some time and then moses makes the final request and he says god please show me your glory you said your presence will go before me now show me that presence show me that glory right show me the the what what you have been speaking about show it to me reveal it to me so that i may see and know that you are powerful he got, he knew it moses knew it but he was just expressing his heart's desire he's saying show me that glory and then we see the response of god you cannot see my face but uh, i will put you on the cleft of the rock you can see my back and uh, and so let's look at a few things that we can learn from this passage it's a very very powerful passage very very powerful encounter that god has uh, moses has with god okay first thing there are different expressions of glo- god's glory right so jesus says that i will make my sorry god says my i will make my goodness pass by you right uh, charles i'll just uh, just complete this few points and then i will answer your question right uh, first one expressions of god's glory i will make my goodness pass before you god's glory brings expressions and manifestations of his goodness right the goodness of god leads us to repentance right uh, so let's let's look at this people god has brought the people out of egypt they are in the exodus they are uh, in the desert uh and in between there are so there are people dying there uh, you know uh, uh, snakes come and all of this and uh, bite uh, people and they die it looks like god maybe moses is wondering what is happening god you you promised that my your goodness will go before me right but here's the thing the goodness of god leads to repentance which means the whole thing of the brass pole and the snake is not god's judgment it is god's goodness god's mercy before his people right if we look at the old testament this you know saying god you've done uh, you know sometimes we look at the old testament and say the old testament god is so angry now most of the time he's angry you no know, i thought god is love yes god is love god is love that's why he despises other things right if you love something you have to hate the other thing right many spaces in the scripture it says that god despises idol worship he despises sexual immorality right uh, so there are things god is love 
but he doesn't despise us he doesn't hate us as a people he loves us but he hates the actions right uh, the book of numbers i guess talks about those seven things that god despises right it's not hate despises right so god is a good god so but we are not to take advantage of it and say okay god is good i can just do whatever i want no uh sin has to be dealt with and so that is what was happening here god made his goodness pass before him there was an expression of his goodness and then we also look at you know uh, uh you know god providing for the needs of the israelites right wherever they went the water followed them their feet did not so not one of them was sick among them that's the goodness of god they had food every day in the desert just an empty land they had food every day that's the goodness of god right two what does it say in that in, in verse uh, i will proclaim the name of the lord before you god's glory will bring about a, a greater revelation of who he is now picture this the israelites have come out they've come to the end of the road and now there's this big red sea in front of them all this while they knew okay god is uh, you know the god of abraham the god of isaac the god of jacob uh, wonderful stories uh, probably they knew all about it but they've not seen the power the revelation of who god is the moment moses would have struck the waters the and the waters parted there would have been a greater revelation in their hearts picture this Hey, we heard about God, uh, you know, doing wonderful miracles in Abraham, Isaac, and Joseph, and our forefathers. But now we are seeing it firsthand. The seas are parted. We are walking in dry land. When the goodness of God is revealed among us, there's a work. There's greater works and miracles. That will bring greater revelation of who God is in our life. Right. Here's what it is. You know, knowledge and revelation is very different. Let me give you this example. Before I was married, you know, we all know that verse, John three sixteen. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. It was easy for me to keep quoting that uh, before marriage. But after I got married and I had a child. and i went back to that verse and i said john 3:16 god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son all of a sudden this same verse which i've been you know quoting for many many times became a revelation in my heart I said god loved the world that he gave his only son i have a son and and i i i i thought to myself what kind of love is this am i willing to give my son for people who are sinful and people who don't even care and all of a sudden john 3:16 becomes a revelation so the goodness of god the glory of god brings revelation in our hearts right uh so even as you and i you know we we continue to pursue god we continue to pray for revival for a move of god and outpouring in our lives and our families god will bring revelations into our hearts you may have known it may have been knowledge but then god can take that knowledge and bring revelation right then he says i will be gracious to was 19 i will be gracious to whom i will be gracious i will have compassion on whom i will have compassion God's glory brings a sovereign demonstration of God's compassion God's grace upon us his people God meets our needs he releases miracles he turns around things uh and he moves among us right that is what the glory of God does the glory of God will automatically bring miracles bring releases healings releases uh, uh meets our needs releases uh, a, a turn of situations right uh, a complete turn something that looked impossible all of a sudden it is possible 
That is what the glory of God does. So that is why we keep mentioning that even as we are praying for the glory of God, for a revival, if we do not see it, remember the glory of God is upon us. The presence of God is going before us. There's a work happening in our lives. There's a work happening in our communities. God is doing it in our midst, right? Two other important factors is to remember is God exposes us only to the level of glory that we can handle, right? Uh, because he doesn't want us to be completely destroyed. Now, remember this, that we are, uh, you know, a natural body. Now, we need a glorified body to see God, right? Glorified mind, glorified uh, so body to see the Lord Jesus face to face, right? So sometimes, now when we look at this whole incident with Moses, God didn't show himself face to face because nobody can see God and live. God himself says that, right? For verse 20, you cannot see my face for no man will see me and live. Why? Because with a natural, you know, Paul writes in his letters and he says, with the corruptible seed, we cannot see the glory of God. But we only the incorruptible can see the glory of God. Meaning we need a glorified body. And we look at it even in the book of Revelations and Thessalonians uh, talks about that. That is why the, the glorified body is important. So sometimes in our natural body, God takes us to certain levels and he may feel that, okay, this much is enough. For Moses, there was a huge task ahead of him. The, the level of glory was so much. If we read 1 Corinthians 39 in, in, in 1 Corinthians, uh, uh, later on after this whole encounter in, in the same book, uh, when Moses comes down, they tell Moses, Moses, cover your face. We cannot see because the glory of God is upon you. And so Moses had to cover his face with a veil. Right? Uh, but Joshua didn't say that. Joshua didn't say, cover your face, Moses. No. But God didn't show Joshua what he showed Moses. So I hope you're trying to get what I'm trying to say. So the levels of glory uh, that God reveals for people or the levels of glory that he conceals for people are different. Right? To Moses, he showed his goodness. And to Joshua, he said, not yet. But Joshua did not say, cover your face. But the people uh, down uh, the mountain, they said, cover your face. We, we cannot see your face uh, because the glory of the Lord is upon you. And he actually covered his face. So God expresses different levels of glory for us as much as we can handle. The more we are in God, spending time in his presence, the more he begins to spend, you know, give us uh, uh, or release the glory of God upon us. Second one. There are some things God reveals. There are some things that God conceals. Now, we will not be able to understand everything. Sometimes God reveals it. Sometimes God conceals it. Right. First Corinthians 13, 9. Uh, uh, First Corinthians 13, 9. Yes, it says, we prophesy in part. We know in part. And we prophesy in part. Right. Uh, so, so we will not know everything. Right, uh, but we know in part we will prophesy in part, right? So the interesting thing is uh, in Second Corinthians chapter three, Paul is writing and he's saying, "Now this what this glory that Moses saw was the glory of the old covenant, but now we are in the glory of the new covenant." So which is greater, the glory of the old covenant or the new covenant? So Paul is writing to the believers and he's saying, it's not the glory of the old covenant because they had to cover their faces. And, and it was uh, what Moses saw was the glory of the old covenant. But the new covenant, the glory of the, uh, the, the, the covenant of the Holy Spirit, the new covenant is greater than that of the glory of the old covenant. Right. So Paul is bringing it out to his to the church there. So each one of us can desire 
uh, uh, God's glory to be revealed among us. Okay, uh, let's just take uh, Charles' question. If God talked to Moses face to face in verse 11, then why did God refuse to show his face in verse 20? Yes, so uh, so we I think we answered that while we looked at the points, uh, Charles. So uh, God spoke to Moses face to face. That was a voice. It was more of a, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the voice of the Lord was ministering to Moses. But in verse 20, again, he says, you cannot see my face and live. So obviously that Moses could not see God's face because he's, he cannot live after that. And we need a glorified mind, a glorified body to see God. And so, uh, so basically, if God had shown himself to Moses, Moses would not have lived. Then, you know, the whole... Uh, uh, you know, the whole plan and purpose for Moses's life would have just died off. So uh, the plan was he had to bring people out of Egypt and uh, there was a call of God upon his life. So that's the only reason why he didn't reveal his face. Uh, but God spoke to, if you look at the Old Testament, God spoke to many people through the voice, right? Um, in the Old Testament, we look at... Uh, uh, was that uh, God speaks to David? God speaks to uh, uh, I forget who's that. Um, uh, that Jacob. God speaks to Jacob also uh, in a certain place. Yes. So God speaks through the voice, but face to face. Uh, yes, say has said that face to face was just an expression of intimacy. Moses enjoyed with God. Yes. So we cannot see face to face unless we've come out of this corruptible body into the incorruptible. Right. Uh, Charles, I hope that answers your question. Okay. I think Charles has gone off the call. Okay. Um, Shri Kumar says it is based. Sorry, Pastor, is it like, uh, as you said that the Moses, God revealed the glory to Moses and yeah. uh, and also the Joshua had a Joshua, the way how the God has revealed to him. So it's a two different, uh, different way. So my question is, is it based on call, like um, how the, the God chose to reveal his glory to these two people? That's my question. Um, yeah. That's for the John, it was, a, it was a different way, how the John in the book of Revelation, he reveals himself. So that's my question. That is a okay. based on call. Thank you, Master. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question, Sri Kumar. See, uh, I would say more than the call, it is based on the hunger for God. Right now, Moses was way more hungry for God, we would say, than Joshua. Joshua was definitely he was a man also hungry for God, uh, but Joshua is more inclined towards. Okay, uh, if you read in the book of Exodus and Numbers, he was more inclined towards organization, administration. Right? He said, okay, you people have to do this, you have to do this, uh, and so God used him in that kind of a setting. Right? He was more of a warrior kind. He made the teams. He sent out people, um, uh, and and you know he did that part. So it's more of Yes, the call, right? Right now, we all have different callings of God, right? But it's more about the hunger for God. The more we are hungry for God, the more God manifests his presence to us. Now, if we are not hungry for God, God is not going to force himself and force his glory and force his presence upon ourselves because we may not be able to handle it. But the more and more we keep seeking God, right? Uh, uh, you know, if, if we are seeking God for five hours a day, a genuine prayer, seeking God five hours a day, and here there's another person seeking God one hour a day, uh, maybe because of commitments also, not only because of hunger, but, uh, uh, but, um, but what I'm trying to get at is God is going to reveal more of his glory and his goodness to the person who's spending more time in his presence. What about the person who's spending one hour? Yes, God is also going to reveal his presence to him as well, but to a level that he's able to contain it to, right? God, even to the end of Moses's life, he said, God, I want to know you more. Later on, towards the end, he says, God, show me, show me once again, show me your glory, he says. 
So it was not that Moses said, okay, I'm done. I, I've seen everything. I've seen the parting of the Red Sea. I've seen manna fall. I've seen the water come out. I've seen God doing these wonderful miracles. So I've seen it all. So that's all right. No. Towards the end of Moses' life, he still said, God, show me your glory. Show me your presence. I desire more of you. Same thing with David, King David as well. He He's a man of God's own heart. Why didn't God just throw him away from being a king after he sinned against, um, you know, and he committed sexual immorality, adultery? Why didn't God just put him away? It was the heart. God sees the heart and he says, this man is, yeah, he's sinned. He's done something wrong, but he's a man after my heart. I know that he's going to come after me. And, and that's what David did. He wept and he mourned and he, he even towards the end of David's life, he said, uh, he, he desired, his heart was so much for God, right? So it's more, uh, yeah, say, as he's saying, Moses wanted to know God's ways and not just his acts, right? So it, you and I can also desire this. The more fervent we are for him, the more we spend time with him, the more his presence, his power, his glory is revealed amongst us as in our personal life and as a community. Right. Okay, so our time's up. Uh, let's just uh, come to a close. We will pick up uh, from next week uh, and uh, we will complete this chapter maybe uh, the next week and then we can uh, almost come to the end of this book. So let's close in prayer. Uh, Yes, uh, could Shri Kumar, can you please close us in prayer? Sure, Pastor. <clears throat> Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this wonderful morning. Lord, we look unto you and we thank you, for Lord and Master, for this opportunity to learn about you, Father God, more and more. I thank you, Father God, for strengthening your servant. Oh, Father God, we pray that Father God bless him and bless his family and Father God strengthen him. So, and equip him, Lord Master, so that he can able to raise up more disciples for your kingdom, O God. Thank you, Father God, for the revealed revelations and the knowledge what you have imparted in each one of our life. We pray that, Father God, whatever we learn today, let it deeply rooted in our heart. Let it never be, Lord Master. Let we let the enemy should not take it from our heart, O God. But, Lord Master, let we deeply root in this, and Father God, so that we can be equipped by your word. We can be equipped by the power of your gl glory. And the same way as, as we learn today, God, Master, let we have that hunger, that Father God, to know you more, and Father God, and Father God, to seek your glory, oh Father God, more and more. Father, we humble ourselves, O oh Lord, and we ask you, Lord, give us grace, that Lord, Master, to, to see your face, and Father, to finish this race, oh Father God, just with that expectation, with that focus, that we're able to do what you have called us to do, God. Thank you for everything, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Shri Kumar. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a great week ahead. God bless you.